it's very hard for us to like, like, you know, my, my son's a digital native, my daughter, it's very hard for us sometimes. Like I see how ingrained it is in their way of thinking. Like there is no world pre-internet for them, right. right? It just doesn't exist. They don't have that reference point. And so I wonder sometimes about nostalgia, you know, the people who are nostalgic of the pre-connected age, right? Yeah. And I know like your, your first book, Six Pixels of Separation, you cover the theme of connectedness and how much closer all these um, digital tools make us. And I know that you've done a lot of work on the business side of things, but you also clearly, you've delved very deeply into the broader sort of social um, dimension to this. And I always see you as, a, as an optimist, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. as to the potential of this technology to make us more productive, make us better, connect us. But there's also another perspective. Um, maybe it's nostalgia. Maybe it's people uh, just getting old. Uh, but a lot of people believe that technology uh, actually isolates and separates us. So I'm going to give you a little quote. This uh, fantastic um, um, psychology academic at MIT, Sherry Turkle, she wrote this book called Alone Together. Sure, she's right. Yeah. been on my show. She's fantastic. Um, and so she writes this. Online, we fall prey to the illusion of companionship, gathering thousands of Twitter and Facebook friends and confusing tweets and wall posts with authentic communication. But this relentless connection leads to deep solitude. So if we zoom out of the sort of this insanely connected life, and on one end, it seems inevitable that it's only going to become more mediated by technology, more connected. I suppose the central question a lot of us have is how much are these technologies connecting us? And how much are they separating us? Or maybe it's both at the same well, time. Well, they're, yeah, they're doing both at the same time. And I would never extract one quote from someone like Sherry Turkle and dismiss it. But it's easy to dismiss that quote because what you're not factoring in, and she talks a lot about this in her work, is the reality that it isn't binary. So it's not we're connected or not mm -hmm. connected. It is what started the connection, how small was it, and how large were you able to expand it? So for every conversation we have about how it isolates us, makes us feel alone, contributes to our mental health, to eating disorders, to comparison, to FOMO, to whatever, this is true. Mm. I could give you probably 20,000 more arguments about how it's connected us. Think about in relation to someone who has some form of physical disability. And suddenly they're egalitarian in terms of being able to communicate and connect in some type of virtual world. It could be a social network. It could be even an online game. We can't dismiss that, that the privilege that we have of being more able-bodied is flattened. It's completely equalized through digital channels. I happen to run a private Facebook group for, for nonfiction and business authors. And it's a small group. It's a couple hundred people. But I would make the argument that that has translated into so many what I would call protein-based engagements, meaning we meet in person. Mm -hmm. I'm traveling to a city. That author's based in the city. Had we not had this private group where we can help one another become better writers, better experience, and use it healthy in a healthy manner, I would have never had those engagements. Think about dating apps. Who falls in love and gets married in this day and age without the help of a dating app? Because if you think about the world without dating apps, it's mind-blowing that what you're doing is predicating your actual future and love based off of probably a two-kilometer radius and luck of walking into some space at the same time as someone else, where now you're expanding it to interests and beyond. Are there problems with online dating? Yeah, we have harassment. We have a ton of issues related to rape. And, I mean, there's tons of problems with it. So, hookup culture, people who just stay yeah, sort of fixated on that thing. Which might relate to things like people not getting as much married now or having as many kids. There's all sorts of things. But the point being is that it's ambiguous. It's ambiguous in the same way that fire is. Fire keeps us warm and has led to a mass amount of innovation. But at the same time, it can burn your house down as it's extremely dangerous. Mm. So the platforms, technology has that ambiguity to it. There's no doubt. But for every negative... I could point to a positive. I could sit here and talk to you of, about how cancerful this technology current is because of how it addicts you, because of how unhealthy it is, because of how as Gen Xers, we remember episodic moments. You watch TV, it was a half hour, an hour, and then you went on to another activity or you watched something else. Now you can scroll aimlessly through TikTok and it never ends. You could lose four hours of your life without having any cognition of the physicalness of time because it never ends. 
you and I used to play video games on Atari or Coleco or in television or whatever it was, Super NES, those games ended. They had levels, they had bosses, and at the end, you won and it was over. Games now never end. In fact, the engines are created to keep you there as much as possible. If you study the area, which I do a little bit, you know that they're not even competing with other media formats now. These technologies are competing with sleep. That's what they're trying to ultimately do. And they have these addictive things built into them, unhealthy. But again, for every story like that, you may be dismissing the person who's going to create the next great innovation because they met somebody through these connected channels. Mm -hmm. I have incredible business relationships over what's coming into three decades. So at least the earliest days of internet connectivity. And a lot of them were 100% digital or originated. They originated digitally and then evolved. Now, think about relationships like that, that you evolve beyond the digital tweet. Now think about how suddenly you've moved from the tweet to texting. So now I have people like a work wife or a your BFF that I see as often as possible, but more often than not, we are connected. Mm -hmm. Now there's the old Chris Rock joke about how it used to be that you went to work and that your spouse was at home, and that person could have died in between that time you'd never know. Now it's like you're working and in the relationship all the time because of texting. Is that good? Is that healthy? Does it help the relationship? Does it not? We have to be able to take the brilliant work of people like Sherry Turkle, the brilliant work of people like Johan Harry, there's David Sachs who talks about living a more analog life. These are great insights that we have to do and understand that like everything else, balance. Mm. What is the balance? So if it's taking over your life or is it an activity? To me, that's the story. It's a story I try to teach my kids. It's the story that I speak to other parents about. And I'll tell you that when we talk about younger people in particular, the biggest thing I see is that they're modeling after their parents, that the kids aren't even close to being as bad as the parents are. The parents don't realize it. They're like, we're mature. We know what we're doing. But ultimately, it's their behavior that is causing the modeling that's pushing it forward. So, you know, a powerful story that I heard recently is a school was looking at digital usage in terms of their students. And what they realized is that in between classes, the biggest problem was parents texting the kids. Make sure you do this. Don't forget this. It's like heli digital helicopter parenting. Mm -hmm. So how do you want the school to move forward with a healthier attitude of activity based using technology when you should in a world where the parents won't stop talking digitally to anybody? So these are the challenges that we have, but I don't think it's a technological challenge. I think we have a cultural, societal, psychological, communal challenge that we have to decide what is our attention worth? Where are we putting our attention to? When is this the best thing ever? And when is it the worst? And being able to identify those moments in between. Yeah, no, I, I love the analogy with fire. And I think you're showing that perspective, that that without and with, and, and you sort of very you were very aware and self-aware as all of, all of these transformations were kind of being hoisted onto us. Okay, what's the boundary? And, and, and you mentioned, so, so fire. But the thing with that is, is you're only as good as the worst person in your network. Mm. So if you've got a kid that has way too much screen time, it might be the kid's friend's parents that are the real problem. Because of what they're modeling and because of what this kid thinks, they're constantly pinging your kid in. And now your kid is trapped in that. And if your kid is not, if your kid resists, we're not going to do this. We're not going to have that kid have a device. They're socially extracting themselves from a social circle that could be really precarious to their development and growth. So, so you're, you're very, very aware of the threats. That, that's something I see, like, right? Like, so nobody would argue that we were better off pre-fire. Like nobody would make that argument, right. right? But at the same time, fire can burn down your house. So the key is, and you mentioned it at, like health. So you mentioned the perspective of health, like doing it yeah. in a healthy way, doing it in a balanced way. And, and now you're, you're giving this perspective on you're only as good as the worst person in your network, which is like, okay, so, so this is what I'm hearing. You, you correct me if I'm wrong. We should not approach it as shiny new object. Let's dive in blindly and just find, figure out later what happens. We should have a little bit of trepidation and a little bit of awareness as to, you know, the potential for good, the potential for bad. And then we need to sort of apprehend these technologies from a broader human perspective and, and also be very aware because I, I don't know how many people would word it so strongly. Like you're only as good as like the worst person in your network 
can actually cause a lot of damage. 100%. So it's like, uh, how, how, how do we go about drawing those boundaries in a sort of in a mature way and not fall prey to shiny new object syndrome of we just sort of get addicted with playing with a new toy? 